Um, Yashoda, you can try and, um, and uh, share your screen. अगर वीडियो बंद चाहे पंडित सुकून नकुन सालू होता है इतना ता इतना तू कुपा करूं चाहे मजबूर पाया करूं का तुझे सुकून नकुन शुरू होता तो हाय यशोदा Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, today's uh, speaker uh, actually doesn't need any introduction um, to the pediatric surgery team in East London. Um, I thank you, uh, uh, Yashoda, for stepping in because we had some last minute changes to the program. And, uh, and she agreed to share her experience from global to local experience about outreach. So for those who uh, are not currently part of pediatric surgery team, uh, Dr. Manik Chand is a consultant pediatric surgeon for just over three years in East London. She comes from Durban. She uh, studied and trained in Durban and um, um, she has worked for more than two years uh, in various countries with uh, civil unrest and, and wars uh, with Doctors Without Borders. 
and um, her main area of clinical interest is uh, pediatric surgical oncology and laparoscopic surgery but uh, this global surgery global pediatric surgery outreach pediatric surgery in africa and uh, inter country um, sort of collaboration within africa is very close to her heart so i think with this introduction yashoda you can start okay uh thank you prof for that intro and uh thank you everyone for giving me this opportunity to share my experience with you all um yes i think prof summed it up quite nicely um i'm going to talk to you it's going to be mostly pictures and because pictures speak a thousand words so i i think you uh will be more entertained by the pictures um than anything else um so let me start uh what is outreach um so it's defined as an activity of providing services to populations who might not otherwise have access to those services and you might ask well what problem is that for us and i'll give you a little bit of a uh, intro on my background um i grew up hindu with the teaching of seva which is um service to humanity and i i am proudly made in south africa born in kwazulu natal in king edward hospital and i believe in the concept of ubuntu which is ubuntu gubuntu gabantu which means uh people are people because of people and more simply put i am because you are and i also grew up with with teachings of unity and diversity and what better place than south africa to grow up with these um with in a melting pot of cultures and races and um backgrounds and um to have united against a system of apartheid um and against oppression and segregation so i grew up thinking that altruism was the most noble of um life purposes and i'm sure all of you would agree with me and i know our department is very much um from that vein so um what is humanitarian medicine is there such a thing as humanitarian humanitarian medicine because isn't all medicine humanitarian well i would say that it is but there is another faction or another a concept of humanitarian medicine which falls outside our usual scope of medicine in our own countries and that is battlefield medicine um emergency teams uh going to disaster situations and that might be um natural or man made disasters and medical aid to remote areas in countries that cannot afford to provide that that medical aid Uh, as well as health education in those areas and help for marginalized groups in affluent countries so this is like refugees for example in recent times go, um presenting in europe and in the us um who are not uh, included in their healthcare and this is often or mostly provided by non-governmental organizations so um this is a cartogram and a cartogram is a <laughs> diagrammatical representation of data so uh what you can see here is a map of the world with um diagrammatically um uh, showing the population and you can see that india is very fat and so is china it takes up most of the 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 page because uh the screen because uh they have the most uh population so this is just an introduction to what a cartogram is and then i'll follow up with child mortality and you can see um where the increased child mortality is the americas are doing pretty well in that respect but you can see africa is big and fat and so is india and southeast asia then gdp is almost uh a color uh, an opposite of the last one and um uh, that makes sense um so europe is nice and fat and so is the us and japan uh but the rest of the world is pretty much non-existent 
And the total spending on healthcare obviously matches this uh, GDP map. Uh, they also look at health service quality and they gave a, a score uh, for essential services out of 72. And interestingly, the, the worst off was Sierra Leone uh, with half of, of, of that uh, score. And most of Africa, um, quite low. India is doing, and China did pretty well. So coming to the distribution of physicians, and I think we are all physicians watching this, and um, these are pretty old statistics, but the ratios and the percentages are pretty much the same. 50% of physicians uh, live in territories with less than a fifth of the world's population, and the worst fifth are served by only 2%. So this is the cartogram of physicians working and I, you can't even see Africa. It's supposed to be <laughs> that sliver of red um, where Africa should be. So um, after my community service, I, I watched, um, or during my community, community service in 2009, I watched the news and I watched the Haiti earthquake. And I thought, well, I'm a qualified doctor now. I would like to go and help. So I joined Médecins Sans Frontier, and uh, that you will hear me saying MSF a lot, which is the French translation of Doctors Without Borders, because um, that's basically what they call it. It was started in France. Um, and they believe in a human, the human right to healthcare, regardless of race, religion, color, or creed, or financial, cultural, uh, and geographical context. And this really rang true with my own principles and they seem to be an NGO that represented my beliefs and my um, my goals for what I would like to you know what what the what I would like to achieve so and these I think we can all agree that this is 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 a basic right but um, it also matters um, I also don't believe that being poor should uh, affect your access to healthcare in any way or what culture you are from. So in, if you are born into a, a Muslim country with Sharia law that everyone in the world looks down upon, that doesn't mean that you, you should not have access to, to adequate healthcare. And also the geographical context, if you are born in a place that is quite remote with less infrastructure, it should not affect whether you survive um, an illness or not. So uh, once I joined um, MSF, I thought, okay, send me to Haiti, uh, but they didn't do that. <laughs> so uh, I didn't speak French and that was their biggest uh, problem, but uh, they decided to send me to Pakistan. And if, um, if you guys are aware of the, the relations of India and Pakistan, you know that uh, they're not very good. Um, since their inception in, in the 40s, um, there haven't been very good relations between them. They have an area of Kashmir that they are still fighting over and they have nuclear weapons that they constantly threaten each other with. But anyway, uh, I'm just giving you a bit of a background because when I went for the briefing before I went to Pakistan, um, that was quite an issue. There was a huge debate about whether they should send me there or not. My name is Yashoda. It's a very Indian name. I look Indian. Um, I'm Hindu. They actually told me to go there and say that I'm Christian because uh, they were afraid for my safety. Uh, but after much debate and me saying that I was comfortable going, um, I went to Pakistan. And more specifically, uh, this area here, which is the Northwest Frontier Province, uh, Khyber Pashtunkhwa, and it's on the, the border with Afghanistan, and uh, uh, between this is the Fatah, which is the federally uh, assigned tribal areas, which you don't see on this map, but basically it doesn't fall under any country because it's, it's ruled by the, the Taliban and, and extremist groups. Um, so I was somewhere around there in a small town on the border. And oh, this, the Fatah is also the area that Obama was bombing with his drones at the time. 
So this was a very um, neglected area as far as healthcare was concerned. Uh, what people should understand is that it, even though it's a very conservative Muslim area with um, quite extreme laws and societal um, laws, uh, the people there are not all extremist and terrorist and they still deserve healthcare. And they were also victims of uh, terrorist attacks and they actually needed mass casualty plans. They needed uh, trauma um, assistance in that area because they also suffered from the bombings of these terrorists. So uh, the other thing I should mention about MSF is that um, our vulnerability is our, 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 was our safety and we didn't have weapons. Our, our hospitals didn't have weapons. We met with both sides of the conflicts and we, um, they understood that we were there only to provide healthcare and to anyone. So anyone from either side of the, the war conflict. We did not take any political sides. So this is Timurgara. Unfortunately, I couldn't take a lot of pictures. I had to be in the car at all times. There were very uh, tough security regulations for obvious reasons. Um, and we mostly traveled in the cars from the office to the hospital and back to the house. And um, these were the sites of Pakistan, a uh, very deep rural Pakistan. Uh, here you can see little girls. Okay, so a little bit about the Pashtun culture. Uh, they're known for their deep re religiosity and extreme uh, religious behavior, uh, but also of their, of their social, uh, traditional and family pride. And uh, every family there had an AK-47 and their pride was very important to them. So they didn't have any problems in uh, shooting anyone that didn't, that threatened their family or even someone within the family that threatened the family pride. Um, on the opposite side of that, they were very warm and very hospitable. And uh, we used to say that Pashtun people made the best friends and the worst enemies because <laughs> if you were their friend, they would kill for you. And if they were your enemy, uh, then they would kill you. So it was quite extreme. Um, and part of that extremism was the segregation of sexes. And here you can see ladies with burqas. Um, and I think I have another picture here um, where society was like this. You didn't see women. They were hidden under burqas. Um, and uh, it wasn't only that they were invisible to everyone else. They were also, if you were on the other side of the burqa, which I tried on, you can't really see much. I wondered how they moved around uh, so deftly without any peripheral uh, visual, uh, vision. Um, but this was what they were used to. And um, it also, it, it, it was very challenging for me, of course, um, coming from a Western society to deal with this problem, but it also, more than that, it was about how they treated their women, uh, which really disturbed me. Uh, so 10 days after I arrived in Pakistan, there was a massive flood and maybe some of you can remember that on the news. And um, it didn't affect Timurgara, but it affected the surrounding areas. And this is Chaktara Bridge. So we were cut off from Peshawar, which, is our, which was our uh, referral hospital, which made things a bit difficult. And also uh, we had to deal with a lot of cholera post the flood. And I say the curse of the flood ferry because that happened 10 days after I got there. And when I went to Thailand on my R&R &R in between, I also went, I, uh, there were floods there as well. So I became known as the flood ferry. So this is where I worked. It was, the, it's the emergency room. You can see our sign there of no guns. And this is our security guard who made sure that that happened. Um, and uh, the things that we saw, mostly trauma, uh, it was violent, but also accidental. So a fair, fair um, number of road traffic collisions. 
uh, as well as cardiac emergencies, which are quite rife, and medical emergencies, tropical diseases because of the rural area and the cholera outbreak, like I mentioned. Hepatitis B, but HIV wasn't a problem there. So this was the resuscitation area. We had three beds uh, where resuscitation happened and we had an observation area that we could send them to. And this is where I supervised and uh, I supervised four uh, Pakistani male uh, doctors and a whole team of male and female uh, nurses. Uh, so what did I do there? I did... Um, a lot of trainings uh, with, uh, in, in regard to triage. This is a picture of one of my triage trainings there. And um, I also planned a mass casualty plan for them and we practiced that for in the event of a bombing. There was one bombing when I was there on Christmas day, but it didn't give us many red cases, um, but there were a few before I, I got there and a few after. Um, but it was essential to have a mass casualty plan in readiness for such uh, events. Um, so I did a lot of trainings and BLS and ACLS, ATLS trainings with the nurses and the doctors in um, the ER. And we had an ER workshop with all the other uh, Pakistani projects and um, basically devising protocols and, and things like that. Um, we also financed investigations, finance investigations, because uh, what happened there was that uh, the family was responsible for getting drugs and uh, so buying drugs from outside so that we could give them inside uh, in the hospital, as well as uh, investigations uh, weren't paid by the government. So for the DOH there. So we tried to finance those emergency investigations, especially on our patients um, to aid in uh, people who couldn't afford it, getting, getting what they needed. Uh, I also planned an ER renovation. It wasn't ideal, um, an ideal space, um, but also a coronary care unit and a an high, dependency, high dependency unit, which was much needed. Um, and I got support from, M the nice thing about working with MSF is that if you can, um, if you can uh, support your requests, they are very happy to get the money and help you set up whatever you want to set up. So it was, it was really nice to be able to have that kind of leverage and um, support. Um, okay, so this was something I saw a lot there, a history of fall from height. Uh, so they were pediatric trauma cases, mostly severe head injuries, and a lot of them required ventilatory support. Unfortunately, we didn't have ventilators there, and they had to be transferred to Peshawar, which was four hours away. Um, and that, uh, and during that transit, they would be bagged by a family member or one of the nurses. Um, so the problem I, I thought was that uh, there, were, there were large groups of children on the roads, on the streets every day, even on rooftops, because they were in Muslim countries, they're very um, accessible. They're flat rooftops. And uh, because of the large families, they had less group supervision. So the mother was invariably inside nursing a baby while the kids were outside. And we can relate to that kind of uh, injury here. So the Ubuntu in, in Pakistan was very strong. Um, so this is the office that we worked in with national and uh, expatriate staff. Um, we had a very good relationship with everyone. We had lunch there every day together. Um, and I don't, and I can't share a lot of the pictures of the females, but this is how they would cover up. I was less um, covered and they understood. Um, they were very accepting of me, very welcoming. Um, and this was in the emergency room and uh, chai was a big part of our day. Uh, it's, it's like how co people drink coffee here. Uh, everything would stop and we would have some chai. Um, and it was a nice team building kind of exercise. Uh, team life was also very important. So this is the, all the expatriates uh, stayed in, in one house and we ate together. Uh, we socialized together. We couldn't go anywhere, like I mentioned before. So we were very restricted. Uh, 
and we needed to be active also. So we had a badminton court in one of the houses. Um, and um, yes, we bonded a lot and um, it, it was a great experience to be amongst um, a global group of people with, with similar aspirations and similar goals. Uh, this guy, Rado, is a friend of mine who stayed a friend, who's actually now married to a South African guy from, uh, from the Free State. So he's really located here. Okay, so since I handled Pakistan pretty well, um, MSF decided that I should go to Iraq next. There was a, a project in Baghdad that I was supposed to go to with an emergency room nurse that we were supposed to start, but something happened and there was a bombing there. So they scrapped that and they decided to send me to Basra. Basra is in the South of Iraq and uh, there was already a team there um, and they were doing trainings of nurses and doctors as well. But because of the insecurity of the situation, um, they weren't able to go to the emergency room at night and you know when where they actually could train with with um, actual patients we weren't really allowed to do that so it was a very restricted environment very very heavy security rules and i didn't i wasn't there long uh, before uh, i was pulled out and before the entire project was closed so um, it didn't work out the way we had planned but what I had, what, what was my um, saving grace was that I got to go to Amman, which is this picture here, Amman in Jordan. And I got to visit some historical sites there and to float in the Dead Sea. So that was nice. Okay, uh, next um, MSF kept me in the same group and we, we called it the Kamikaze group for <laughs> obvious reasons, they were very, insecure regions that were in this group, but the next was Libya. And this was an emergency project and it was during the revolution in 2011. So it was during the time of um, the rebels uh, revolting against Gaddafi. Um, so these are some pictures uh, to show you uh, what it was like there. Um, I was in Benghazi for most of it. Um, and Benghazi was the rebel stronghold of the revolution. It was the area where the most uh, rebels came from. And rebels is, is not the right word because they were educated people. They were um, people that were just revolting against a very oppressive regime. And I, I mean, I, I um, Muammar Gaddafi was, was a benevolent dictator, I like to call him, because he took care of his people, but he oppressed them and he oppressed their freedoms because if they did speak up against him, they would be killed. And that's what happened in Benghazi. So this is the shellings that are from, from uh, Gaddafi's uh, attack of Benghazi. And this is some of the tanks and vehicles that were bombed coming into Benghazi. Uh, to squash the revolution. Um, so the people in Benghazi actually um, had um, support of the international NATO who bombed uh, Gaddafi's people coming in. And this is just the remnants of this. And there's lots of pictures of the people who died, which is like uh, behind here. Um, this is the hospital that we supported, the Al Jala Hospital. It wasn't very, it wasn't uncommon to see these kind of vehicles with, with guns mounted on them. So the projects I had there, we were a very small team. I was the only medical person, and we had a, a field co who was in charge of security, and a logistician uh, who handled everything else, transport and radio and uh, setting up of any facility. So I had pretty much free reign to do whatever I thought was needed. So I met with, the, this is the, the staff of Al Jala Hospital who I met with and I helped them with the mass casualty plan. We did a training and we did a practice which went really well. If anything had to happen in Benghazi, they would go to the Al Jala Hospital. So it is very important for them to have that. 
Uh, this man is Osama. He is a Libyan American who came back during the revolution to help uh, because he had left initially because of the oppression of that regime. And he came back to help and um, he and another doctor, a Libyan doctor, uh, purchased some ambulances and this field hospital, which they uh, themselves out of their own, um, you know, they, they weren't supported by the DOH, but they did this privately. Um, and a whole bunch of medical students like this guy um, who volunteered themselves to go to the Eastern front line, which was in Ajdabia. And they would drive to the front line where, um, uh, where the, war, the conflict was going on and they would bring back the war wounded. Um, it was a very brave and noble um, act that they did and they were taking their lives in their own hands and they, they, uh, they were very brave and very inspirational. So it was a, it was a pleasure to help them. I did an ATLS training with them and we provided them with stuff that they needed. Um, and then I was also involved in, a, uh, I set up a protection against violence committee uh, together with a local gynecologist um, where we trained healthcare workers on sexual gender-based violence, which was becoming rife. And in any war situation, that's what happens. Um, and it, you can imagine in a Muslim country as well, uh, it's, it's quite a challenge to get uh, people to come forward and um, it's, yeah, it's, it's quite a challenge to seek uh, help as well. And this was uh, not uncommon from on my trip from Benghazi to Ajdabia to see some camels crossing the road. So with all of that going on, we also needed a team life and to balance uh, everything that was, uh, that we had to deal with. Um, so it was a team of three, which changed every so every few months. And um, some of you might recognize Ellen, who is the psychologist that we brought in um, for the SGBB project, <laughs> as well as the war wounded and trauma from the, uh, from um, the PTSD that a lot of people were suffering from. And uh, we managed to do a, a team trip to Susa and Apollonia, which are beautiful historical sites um, that you can actually walk into. It's, it's not like anywhere else in the world. Um, okay, so um, getting to Africa or more, more specifically Sub-Saharan Africa. This is a, a quote from uh, Fidel, our comrade <laughs> Fidel Castro. Hundreds of thousands of African doctors need to be trained, but nobody worries about it. There's a rich part of the world that only cares about oil, diamonds, minerals, forests, gas, and cheap labor. And um, I totally agree with that sentiment. Not that I'm a communist. Um, so coming to Africa, um, we have the 24% of the world, uh, world's burden of disease, but only 3% of the health workers. And um, our population is increasing. And as I mentioned before, the number of physicians is abysmal. So after I came back from Libya, I told MSF that I would like a nice, slow, easy, secure project and they gave me uh, the option of going to a malnutrition project in Ethiopia, which I happily took. Um, so this is one of the places in Ethiopia I was. It's um, a very rural. There's no electricity infrastructure. There's no water infrastructure. There's a river, um, but it's very dry. This, was, this is a region in Somaliland, which is um, on the border with Somalia. So it's a very dry desert-like region. And um, MSF started a, a malnutrition project there from nothing, basically. So this is the field hospital uh, made of tents and um, they treated malnourished children, but also emergencies coming from that area. Um, the outpatient um, malnourished um, nutrition project was uh, aimed at children and pregnant women. These were some of our patients. And this is Yasmin, my favorite. 
And uh, this is Simrit, who is, who is a nurse who became a good friend of mine. And this is how we lived. Uh, we lived, we stayed in uh, these huts or rondavals. We had one each, which was nice. And this was our socializing, eating area. And this was our toilet. So basically it was a hole in the ground. And this was all made by MSF uh, so that we had somewhere uh, to ablute. And uh, this was our only um, access to clean water, which MSF also had to bring in. Um, so this was, uh, was not there initially. And um, obviously they, they had to bring everything in to four, uh, for the staff and for the running of the hospital. So whenever I, we have load shedding here or your know, water stops or anything, just remember there's places like this where people um, have to do with what they, with the little they have. Um, so once I had enough experience in that malnutrition project, I was sent to another province, RC, uh, where I did an explo um, for setting up a new malnutrition project um, because even though it looks nice and, and green here, uh, they still, they, they were suffering from a drought in the season and the next season would mean uh, dire insecurity for food uh, for that area. Uh, most of the population was very rural. This was a village that we went to um, which was in a valley and the nearest health center was hours away by foot and up a mountain. So they were very remote. Um, so we decided to do some outreach there and we set up an outreach project going there, but also to support a lot of the health centers in that area. And the Ubuntu in Ethiopia also, this was an Emmy. This is Simrit doing a coffee ceremony, which if, uh, if you've been to Ethiopia, or if you know any Ethiopians, you know, this is quite a, a nice, um, very hospitable coffee ceremony that they do for you. Um, and um, this was my team going into RC. I uh, was the only female, but they made me feel very comfortable. And it was quite, um, pleasant, and that's just me and again. Okay, so coming to surgery. Uh, once I got back from Ethiopia, I decided to, decided to torture myself by um, specializing. <laughs> I'm just joking. I decided to go into surgery um, and get some surgical experience. So I um, actually first I, I joined um, a rural hospital in, in KZN and, and supported an HIV project that MSF had there. They asked me to do that. So I did that with them. And then I joined uh, the pediatric surgery unit in uh, Durban. Uh, so the global surgical workforce is even more shocking than the physician, as you can imagine. Uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the 0.5 surgeons per 100,000 people and it's less than 1%, the surgeon density of other high income countries. And these are some more shocking statistics to look at. This is obviously the developed world and the developing world. Um, and yeah, you can see for yourself. Um, so I looked at the number of pediatric surgeons and these are just some examples that I put on um, and South Africa, I think is quite maybe on par with Nigeria. We must have 40 to 50 pediatric surgeons at the moment. Um, but you can see there are countries who are in dire need of support. So once I qualified um, in 2016, I decided I would try more outreach and um, I went to support another pediatric surgeon, uh, Bup Nandi, who was British, but he was in Lilongwe in Malawi and he needed help. And Malawi is not called the warm heart of Africa for nothing. This is the kind of smile and 
uh, face that and friendly face that you will see everywhere in Malawi. So uh, Malawi, just for a bit of background, Malawi is one of the poorest countries in the world. I think uh, Niger qualifies as the poorest, but Malawi is second poorest um, with, you know, uh, in terms of money, but population wise, Niger is bigger. Um, so they don't have money for healthcare. And uh, we were in Lilongwe, which is the capital city of Malawi, but the resources there were extremely poor. And I'll show you some of what I'm talking about. Um, there is a pediatric surgeon called Eric Borgstein, uh, really remarkable man in um, Blantai in Malawi. And he, he um, serves half of the country, but someone needed to be in Lilongwe as well. And that was what Dr. Nandi was doing. So they have tumors for Africa also, and uh, they are very late presentations. Uh, these children are coming from rural areas with uh, poor infrastructure, often uh, walking from villages and uh, very far out reaches of areas. Uh, they also have a longer wait for surgery because uh, they, they aren't surgeons, they aren't facilities to do the surgery. And uh, um, also a lack of resources. So you would be hard pressed to find a bottle of Hibitane in this hospital. And I'll show you more of what I mean, but things like consumables, like um, uh, diathermy pads, we used to reuse multiple times as much as we could because we couldn't just discard it. Um, so that was what we were dealing with there and tumors like this. Um, so just to give you a, a picture of what, what we used to deal with there, um, there was a case of Wom's tumor in a three-year-old girl. Uh, we did the operation in this, uh, well, first of all, she, she got only vincristine because that's the only thing that was, only drug that was available there. Um, and a Ugandan, uh, Oncolo pediatric oncologist was there. He was a volunteer worker paid by an NGO. Otherwise there wouldn't be anyone there, of course. And uh, they also paid for the chemo. So she only got Bing Christine for a couple of months and had an ultrasound showing that there was some improvement and was planned for surgery. So we did her surgery here, which is actually their Burns uh, theater. There's light coming in from the windows, and this was a light that uh, Dr. Nandi just brought in from his home. It's just a spotlight light, um, not surgical lights. And we did the operation there. Also, uh, we don't, they don't have anesthetists at all. So clinical officers who are actually not even medical are trained to give anesthetics there. And um, they are not, obviously not very, um, comfortable with children, which is why they had a longer wait, the pediatric cases. Luckily, there's a Texan NGO, uh, there's a Texan hospital, Texas Children's Hospital, which um, supports Lilongwe, um, especially the pediatric um, department. And a pediatric anesthetist came while I was there so that we could do a long list of tumors and PSOPs and Hirschsprung's pulls all these um, major operations that had been waiting for months. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we, we did the operation there. And then this was her transfer uh, after the operation. She was uh, recovered outside there. And then we had to take her down three flights of stairs and there is no ICU as you should have guessed <laughs> but this is where we were taking her to and this is called the emergency zone uh, it is a pediatric resuscitation unit uh, more accurately um, at the um, at the front here there's the three resuscitation beds and every time I went there there was a child uh, a mother crying and a child dying, and it was a very busy unit. Um, there were four beds per, uh, four children per bed um, generally. And um, it looks like a mess and it looks like chaos, but it was the best place to get uh, your 
post-op children monitored well and um, throughout the night. Uh, they also had their fair share of burns, as you can see. And team life there, we tried to escape to Lake Malawi. That's Lake Malawi. It's really beautiful. And we got some downtime. These are some of the Texan uh, pediatricians who work there. Okay, so what are the challenges to access to surgical care? Uh, we talked about some of it already. Uh, poor infrastructure, human resource, resource, um, human resource shortages, of course poor referral systems and um, professional isolation like in those areas that I went to and a lack of educational resources. So what can we do? Uh, we can train more medical officers. We can try task shifting like the clinical officers in Malawi um, and we can strengthen our referral systems. Um, we also can educate and support rural doctors in those referral systems and uh, improve our internet con connectivity so that we can have better communication and training. So coming to home, um, I my MED was done on this on pediatric surgery outreach. I looked at the referrals coming into Durban and the delays in transport and delays in, in diagnosis and transport and um, how it's related to morbidity and mortality. And obviously, uh, not surprisingly, it was just statistically significant that uh, the longer the delay, the higher the mortality. So I identified Umkanya Kude as the, the district most in need of an outreach program. Um, so this is Zululand, actually, not Umkanya Kude. And then I think you'll all recognize Prof Hadley over there. And this is Prof Hayes Jordan, who is a leader, leading expert in, in rhabdomyosarcoma from America. She was visiting us and we took her on our outreach uh, visit. And what we found was district hospitals with very good uh, surgical uh, operating rooms and facilities and wards that could manage um, uncomplicated patients. So what are the pitfalls of an outreach program? Um, you will always get mixed, um, uh, mixed uh, receptivity with some people being enthusiastic and some people being apathetic and you need partners in the district level to um, help you achieve what you need to achieve. And sustainability because it needs to continue uh, when one person is not there anymore. Uh, also the lack of resources and the distance and accessibility. And this shows the access problem, which is why the planes are, were, were a good option for us in KZN. Uh, so coming back here to East London, um, I started here three years ago and uh, we have some outreach, um, we have some outreach going on. <laughs> So this is uh, Queenstown Frontier Hospital. That's Prof. Adam Targonsky, and you know these three, uh, Prof. Uh, Chidnis and Zondile is there. And uh, we do, um, we try to do a, a clinic uh, every month there, and which has been halted with COVID, but we hope to take that up again. It improves our, our communication with, uh, with that uh, level and um, strengthens our referral system. Um, we also uh, went to the Rudasa conference in 2018 and uh, spoke to the clinical officers and the district level uh, doctors and they really appreciated our presence. They really appreciated our training and showing them uh, congenital abnormalities and what to do at their level. It was, uh, it was quite a good experience. And this is Dr. Thomas. We went to Amtata in 2018, 2017, 2018, um, to give them a talk on pediatric surgery outreach, um, oncology, sorry. So what are the ideas going forward? Um, I believe that we can, we can uh, start a BRICS initiative, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. We already have an economic alliance, and I believe in the health sector, these middle income countries in the developing world can act as leaders in the developing world, rather than high income countries 
where most of our protocols management research is coming from at the moment. So I think a, a move in that direction would be beneficial for the developing world. Um, also, I think that South Africa and all these countries should act as leaders uh, and support the rest of their region. And uh, for us, that's Sub-Saharan Africa. And I've shown you how uh, dire the need is. Um, so last year, I went to the COSEXA examinations and they train pediatric surgeons from all over Africa. Uh, well, Central, Southern and Eastern Africa. And this is the group of people um, that the examiners from uh, different countries, uh, Prof. Kukila Laku from Oxford University, uh, I mean, department. And this is Prof. Borgstein from Malawi, Vanda from, who is the only pediatric surgeon in Mozambique at the moment, um, Agneta from Kenya, Phyllis and John from Uganda. Um, and it's great to meet these people. It's great to have relationships with them and to see uh, where we can support each other, especially in the examinations. Uh, I was an observer and they passed six uh, new pediatric surgeons from all over Africa, which is gonna make a huge difference in those countries. Um, so what are my parting words? Um, this is my own little aphorism, reaching out to reach in. I think we reach out uh, to other people and to mankind in order to reach into ourselves. Um, I believe that, and philosophy and, uh, you know, biology even tells us that the outside world is just a reflection of what's going on inside our heads. We are, uh, we are just, the outside world is just an interpretation of the sensory perception of uh, what happens. So, uh, quantum physics is also showing us that the microcosm is reflected in the macrocosm and there's a unified field that permeates everything and that fits in very nicely with spirituality and the interconnectedness of all things and it's it's now irrefutable with quantum physics proving this. Um, so that's my parting word, we should be helping each other and what can we do, we should always ask ourselves what we can do. And you might call me an idealist, but then I'll leave you with the words of this guy. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's it. Uh, Yashoda, that was absolutely fascinating, amazing, uh, interesting, enlightening. I'm falling short of adjectives. I'm I'm not flattering you. And... Uh, it was actually a blessing in disguise that we had to postpone our scheduled talk and uh, you agreed uh, on the short notice to give this talk. It, uh, I think this was long overdue. Three years was a pretty long time, but uh, the time was right now. And, uh, and it is absolutely fascinating that you have not just visited as a tourist, but you have gone and um, worked in those areas which we only read in, in books and maybe watch in movies and in TV serials. So, so especially the Northwest Frontier Province from where Justice the, the girl Malala comes and, mm -hmm. and all the areas of Iraq and, and Libya, it's absolutely amazing. And actually, that's what makes you whole. And um, also, I liked uh, the way you presented. It's actually a masterclass for all the juniors attending this talk, how there should be absolutely minimum words on the slide. And you just talk around nice photos. And I loved all your photos. So, so thank you very much. And I don't want to take uh, too much time. I'm so happy that I could see lots of familiar faces in your uh, photographs of Cosexa. And, uh, and we have also contributed a little bit uh, uh, towards the examiners, uh, Ken Muma, who, uh, right. is, uh, who is a pediatric surgeon in, in Kijabe in Kenya. He was our fellow in 2013 and we very fondly remember him. And, and, he was uh, an examiner. So, so I think, Yashoda, we, 
have made or we are making a small difference. Uh, you and I have spoken informally about this. Uh, our dreams are big, but I think we must always dream big. And uh, even if 50% of your and my vision comes true, um, it it's will be a very significant achievement. So, so I think uh, we, through the GICS and the BRICS Alliance and COSEXA, um, the pandemic will be over soon, if not in one year, one and a half years. So we will start that program like how Dr. Mbaye visited from Dakar, Senegal this year. I'm sure if not in 2021, in 2022, we should be able to restart that, uh, that program of uh, pediatric surgeons from the rest of Africa coming and spending a few months with us. So I think without uh, really eating much time, I would like to invite uh, Professor Colin Lazarus to just give his thoughts and, and its comments. Please, uh, Colin. Yashoda, yeah. that was an absolutely superb talk. And it, it's a testimony to uh, your courage in going out to places where most of us would not wish to go. And uh, it's been a remarkable uh, testimony to what you've done so far with your life. And I just congratulate you for that. So can I ask you two questions? Yes. Because you're, I'm sure you just slipped over them. The first is, were you fearful at times? And the um, second one, well, talk to me about that first, and then I'll ask the second. <laughs> um, I actually wasn't, and I'll tell you why. I, I really, um, I had a lot of faith in, in the security that MSF pro provided. I, uh, yeah, I, I was very, I felt very secure at all times. In fact, I even challenged some of their security rules uh, in, in Pakistan and things, because I felt so uh, welcome. It wasn't always like that, of course. When I first went, it was a bit of a challenge. The, the male doctors and nurses even didn't like the idea of me, but they warmed up to me and I, I felt quite comfortable and safe because those are the people of that, you know, that area. The same in Libya. And this, those were probably the most insecure areas I was in. There was a bombing when I was in Benghazi, but MSF is very quick to react. They they um, uh, kept us uh, kept kept us under house arrest for a while. They even considered flying us out, but then you know everything calmed down, so we we managed to stay. We even managed to do some traveling uh, in Libya. So honestly, I didn't feel. Um, I wasn't actually scared in any of those situations, <laughs> which sounds weird, <laughs> but, uh, but I, you know what, uh, my family was scared for me, <laughs> so <laughs> they were the ones. Um, and you know, you're so wrapped up in the work and what's going on that, uh, you know, I didn't really think about it in that way. All right, thank you. <laughs> and if I may ask the second, yeah. were there times when you worked many days consistently on duty, nights and days? Uh, no, I, I would say no, because um, like I said, they, they are, the MSF is very, very careful not to put too much pressure on you because you're already under a lot of pressure being in this strange place. And um, so one of the security rules that I broke while I was there uh, in Pakistan was during, we weren't allowed to go at night. It was only the surgeon and the anesthetist who could go to the hospital at night. And I broke that security rule when I went to help out um, in the night during Ramadan because my colleagues who were national staff and from there were fasting. So 
I felt bad and I wanted to help, but I, I got reprimanded for that quite severely. And um, no, like, like I'm saying, even in Iraq, we couldn't go anywhere at night. They, we were strict security rules, so we didn't work through the night um, at any point. Good. Thank you, Yashoda. Okay. Yeah. Uh, th thank you, Colin. Yashoda, uh, I just want to make one um, minor observation. Uh, this uh, Somaliland, um, aren't they now sort of claiming to be a sovereign country? Um, uh, because uh, there have been delegations from Somaliland um, medical fraternity to mm. Uh, GICS meetings and even at WOFAPs and uh, I, I believe they have even started a medical school there. Uh, so so uh, was, was that, uh, had that started happening while you were there? No. Uh, so this was in 2011 yes. and they were still part of Ethiopia and Ethiopia has different regions and um, there's like highlands and lowlands and yeah. highland, the highlands is, you know, the Addis and all those places. And that's mostly where the, uh, the governmental organizations and, you know, the organiz organization of the country or bureaucracy comes from. Yeah. But there are factions like Somaliland, Somali people in Somaliland, but also the Oromia and I forget the region name, yes. but they, they, are, they claim to be marginalized as well by yeah. the... Ethiopian government. So I can believe that there has been some, um, you know, unhappiness or yes. discontent and, and need to separate from, from them. Yeah. Yes, yes. And just one sort of um, comment, uh, you know, what worked in your favor is that you followed uh, the local culture because uh, when you went to um, three of these Muslim into inverted commas countries, you yeah. dressed like them and you respected the local culture. So I think that is something, uh, again, we all need to learn, the juniors need to learn that uh, we, when, wherever you are, whether you are in East London or wherever, you need to respect the local culture and, and try and sort of behave with respect. So I think that really went into your favor, Yashoda. Yes, it was very important to assimilate yeah. uh, culture-wise, especially in Pakistan, because they, like I said, yes. if they don't like you, they'll kill you. So yeah. <laughs> I was lucky that they warmed up to me. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I would have been in trouble there. So, yeah. And um, you, the, you were of so the wrong I'm, religion there. Wrong religion, yes. Yeah. Even though <laughs> of the right even, color, but wrong, wrong <laughs> religion. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was. Okay. And I, I didn't bother to lie about that. No, I mean, no. it wasn't, it was obvious to everyone. No, so uh, it's better to tell the I truth. Have so many, I have so many warm stories to share about yeah. Pakistan and the people there because everyone assumes that, you know, that part of Pakistan is full of extremists and terrorists and they all believe in this kind of, uh, you know, violent behavior and, you know, a way of getting their way. But the people that I met and I worked with were amazing, wonderful, warm people. And think, they were nothing like the Taliban. Think, Where, the Taliban actually does come from there, yeah. but uh, they were nothing like that. I think that's that's your talk for next year, Yashoda. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I need to get uh, comments from our two other consultants, yeah. two, three consultants. Uh, so, Selo, I know you had some uh, technical problems today. Are you still around, Selo? Is Dr. Machaya still around? I don't hear him. I know Dr. Majola is there. So, Kululeko, you want to make any comments, ask any questions? I, I don't know whether they have left or lost connection. Um, anybody else wants to ask any question, make any comment? either Mia or our junior colleagues or colleagues from outside the department? Okay. Hi, yes.
Yes. Hi. Yes. You hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Is that Mia? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Mia, yeah. Please go ahead, Mia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Surely you know this is also a topic that's quite close to my heart. Um, yeah. Me, well, like, coming from Belgium, this is my um, coming to South Africa was always because I wanted to go uh, abroad with uh, MSF, and then got stuck here because I met met, met my husband. Um, <laughs> Um, but I'm very happy here and I'm very happy working in the government hospital so that I still have um, doing some outreach or sort of like a helping the, the needy uh, people here. So yeah, it was very, very interesting to, uh, to see your slides and hear your, your story. Uh, thanks a lot for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks Mia. Mia. Mia, we all are delighted that you are stuck in East London till you retire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if there are no comments, I really want to thank Yashoda uh, for sharing her story, which is most important so that we can know her better and, and sharing her really different experiences, which very few of us have ever imagined about, um, never experienced. And this must be quite an inspirational uh, talk to listen. To, to, to all the juniors, it was for me. So we are actually finishing right on dot, six to two minutes, which is also good. So thank you everyone, have a good evening. And next week, uh, Dr. Manik Chan will host the meeting and, uh, and uh, it will be on, on stress amongst doctors and how to prevent it and how to look after yourself and your colleagues. So good night all.